Thank you, choir musicians, for that blessing. Good morning. Good to see you all today. Uh, we're going to be continuing through the book of Galatians this morning. And so uh, let me invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And let me pray for us. One more time this morning. Lord, <clears throat> um, we do thank you for the cross. The climax of human history. Uh, the event that changed the world. And it's through the cross we gather together. And worship you today. And I pray now, Lord, that you would help us as we look at your word. Your word, Lord, is so deep and so rich in the plan that you have been working, are working from the beginning of creation to eternity future. Lord, is so great and so wise, Lord, we can hardly fathom it. Pray you would help us. Enlighten us to just grasp as much of it as we can today. So speak to us now through your word by the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3 again this morning. Um, we got a lot of ground to cover, but I think it's going to be rich. For us this morning. So I want to review uh, so that we can remember where we are and what's, what's going on in the book of Galatians. You remember in chapters 1 and 2, Paul is defending his authority and his gospel. Uh, some false teachers called Judaizers had entered into the churches of Galatia and were basically teaching a false gospel that says, it's not enough to believe in Christ, but you also have to, have to keep the Jewish law to truly be saved. And Paul responds by saying, If anyone preaches a gospel different from the one I preach to you, let them be cursed of God. And Paul defends his authority by saying that he did not receive his authority from the other apostles, but rather he received direct revelation from God himself on the road to Damascus and a special calling from God to proclaim the gospel of free grace to the Gentiles because they too are being welcomed into the people of God by faith in Christ. And after his conversion, he, did, he spent very little time with the apostles. He only went to Jerusalem twice in a period of 14 to 17 years. When he did share his gospel with the other apostles, they affirmed it and affirmed his ministry to the Gentiles. And in fact, in a particular event, when Peter acted hypocritically by separating himself from the Gentiles when other, when other Jews had, had come to the church in Antioch, Paul openly rebuked the apostle Peter himself to his face for his hypocrisy. So Paul clearly shows that his authority is from God and not from man. And then in chapter 3 last week, he begins his theological defense that the Gentiles are people of God too by faith. And therefore, they should not be required to become Jews uh, in order to be saved. They, we know this because uh, of experience and scripture. The Galatians received the Holy Spirit. When? When they believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's how they received the Holy Spirit, not by Becoming Jews, not by keeping the law. And not only that, but the scripture says that Abraham himself was justified by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And therefore, Paul says that true Jews then, the true people of God, are not those who share in the blood of Abraham, but in the faith of Abraham. And then... Paul explains that the law cannot save because the law curses those who break it. Everyone who breaks the law is under a curse. Therefore, Jesus became a curse for us on the cross, paying the penalty 
that the curse demanded for our sin in, other, in order that we might die to the law, be set free from the law's demands over our lives, free to serve the Lord. So, all this discussion begs the question, begs a couple things. What, if the law cannot save, and if, and if the law is not required for access into God's people, then why was there a law in the first place? That's a good question. There's, there's several issues uh, related to that we're going to address today. But the, the topic of our sermon today is the promise beats the law. If the promise and the law had a rock, paper, scissors match, the promise would win every time. <laughs> the promise wins. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The promise wins, and it wins through Christ. And so three things we're going to see from our text today. The promise is given to Christ. The law guarded us till Christ, and we are heirs through Christ. The promise is given to Christ. The law guarded us till Christ, and we are heirs through Christ. First, um, the promise is given to Christ. And uh, we haven't read our text yet. So if you're able and willing, let's stand in honor of the reading of the word of God. And let's read our text today in Galatians chapter 3. Verse 15. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came... We were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. The word of God. You may be seated. So the first thing we're going to see is that the promise is given to Christ. So God... And if you were in Sunday school this morning, we talked about this. So you missed on a blessing this morning if you didn't come. But God made a promise to Abraham. What did God promise him? In Genesis chapter 17, is, he, he, he gives the promise to Abraham a few times, but this is one of the clearest. In Genesis 17 verse 4, he says, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a, a father of a multitude of nations. That's what Abraham means, father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you, and to your offspring after you. And I will give you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all of the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. 
Paul contrasts law and promise, and the emphasis on promise is this. When you, the promise, the emphasis on promise puts the focus not on Abraham, but on God. When you make a promise to someone, you are saying, I am going to do this. It is going to happen because I am promising it to you. So the promise contrasts with the law because the promise is is directly from God. The blessings were ultimately not dependent on what Abraham and his offspring would do, although that's, that's important. But it's ultimately, ultimately dependent on what God had promised. So Paul's argument flows like this. In verse 15, Paul says, look, even in a human covenant, in a human covenant that you make, you don't change it afterwards, or you're not supposed to. You don't, you don't come along and say, oh, by the way, I'm not going to do that anymore. When you make a human covenant, so, nothing is supposed to change it later. When you make it, you're saying this is what's going to happen. You're giving your word. Well, God made the promise to Abraham, and what Paul understands and what Paul is saying is that the promise stands. The promise that God made to Abraham is always going to stand, regardless of what comes after. And so his point in verses 17 and 18 is that the Mosaic law, which included the Ten Commandments, but also the social, moral, and ritualistic laws, that the law came 430 years after God gave the promise to Abraham. But the law comes after, what comes after does not nullify, the law does not nullify or change or alter the promise that God previously gave. But and so, God's, God's promise stands even after the coming of the law. And then in verse 18, Paul says uh, this, If the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. In other words, if, prom- if, the, if the promise came by, if the blessings, if the inheritance came by the law, no one would get it. Because we all break the law. Look at Israel. They had the law and they, they blew it. And they were exiled from the land. So the point is, is that the, if the inheritance came by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But bless the Lord, God gave it to Abraham by promise. And I want to think, about, I want to think for a minute about this concept of inheritance. Inheritance is the word that's picked, up, that's picked up from the Old Testament, Paul is saying here. But it has what we would call typological escalation. And I'm going to explain that. <laughs> I'm going to explain that, don't worry. What am I saying? The blessing to Abraham was a land and a people. And the land in that people... Uh, the people in that land, uh, God would be their God there. You see it? That was the promise. Well, in the book of Joshua, the language of inheritance is referred to, is used to refer to what? The portions that each tribe would receive in the promised land, right? So when they go into the promised land to conquer it, 500 years after the God gave the promise to Abraham, they're calling their, their, the, what they're, the land that they're receiving in Canaan, they're calling it their inheritance. In other words, the Jews, 500 years after the promise, still understood that by going in and conquering the promised land, they are receiving the inheritance. That is, God is keeping his promise 500 years down the road. But God is keeping his promise. So the inheritance then... What it means biblically is it's the concept of receiving what God has promised. To receive the inheritance is to receive the blessings that God has promised. But what we see in the New Testament through Christ is that the New Testament writers and Paul understood that, that those things that, that God was wrote in the Old Testament and that God was working... Inside those things, God was talking about something deeper and something fuller, a deeper reality. 
And we see this, uh, like we've talked about last week, when Paul talks about what it means to be a Jew. In other words, in the Old Testament, they view things primarily in terms of, of physical realities. I'm a Jew because I have the blood of Abraham through my veins. But in the New Testament, something changes. Paul understands that, some, that God is changing the way he's relating to the world because those things were types. That's where the word typological comes from. They were types. They were pointing, they were realities pointing to even greater realities beyond themselves. And Paul understands that. He's saying a true Jew now in Christ is a true person who's in the covenant with God is not someone who merely is a, is a physical Jew and who's physically circumcised, but someone who shares in the faith of Abraham. They are a child of Abraham. They are a person of God. Well, the inheritance, the same thing happens to the inheritance. The inheritance is seen in a fuller and greater light. The inheritance uh, that, that, uh, that God made to Abraham, the promise, is not just, is not just uh, physical descendants in a real estate in the Middle East. It's something far greater than that. It is the sum total of salvation. It is people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, children of God, by faith, who receive a new heavens and a new earth and live with God forever. You see it? And Paul is saying that this inheritance can either come from law or promise. It can't come from both, but thank God it comes by promise. We inherit the promises of God through Christ. And how do we inherit the promises of God through Christ? Verse 16. This, if that was heavy, it's about to get heavier, guys. Sorry. Hopefully, hopefully you can follow me. Verse 16 is a very interesting verse if you think about it. We have to think about it very carefully. Look at it. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. What is Paul saying? Now, the word offspring literally is, a, is seed. In the Greek and in the Hebrew, it's the word for seed. Now, seed is a collective singular. When I say I have a bag of seed, I'm not telling you I have a bag that literally has one seed in it. right? It's a singular term but that we use to refer to, has a plural concept, right? Seed. Well, that's how we use the term. Well, that's how they use the term too, as a collective singular. That, that, I mean, that's pretty much how everybody uses the term. Nevertheless, Paul, when he reads the Old Testament, and he reads the promise that God gave to Abraham, that God would, would, would give the land and, and the people and a blessing to your offspring, Paul reads that to mean that, that God is talking actually specifically about one person. You see that? That's how Paul reads it. That's how he understands it. The question is, how is Paul justified in interpreting it that way? How can Paul say reading that, that verse that God is promising all the blessings to one man. Let me try to explain it. If you read the Bible carefully, now hear me now, if you can get this, it's, it'll change the way you read the Bible. There is a thread that runs through the Bible. A thread that points to one man who represents the whole, who saves the many. Let me show you. Abra, uh, Adam, when Adam sinned, Adam represented all of humanity, because he literally was all of humanity. When Adam sinned, all of humanity sinned with him and in him. Romans 5 explains that. Therefore, we all experience the, the pain and the curse of Adam's sin because we were in him, with him, as he sinned. All of humanity fell with Adam. Adam represented us. 
But right after the curse, what does God say? God says, I will give you a seed of woman and Satan shall bruise his heel, but he will crush Satan's head. One man to redeem the world from sin. You see? Now follow the thread. Noah. Who was Noah? Noah represented who? All of faithful humanity that was left on the earth. One man. And Noah, what did he do? He trusted God. And what did he do? He built an ark. And as he built the ark, he proclaimed the gospel. What was the gospel that he proclaimed to the world as he built the ark? You come with me into the ark and you will be saved. You see? Of course, he built an ark in the middle of the desert. Of course, people are going to wonder what in the world he's doing. He trusted God. And if people would have believed Noah's word and got into the ark, they would have been saved. But they didn't believe and they perished. But Noah, through his trust in God, one man saved all of faithful humanity. And we exist today because Noah trusted God. Because humanity was only continued through him. One man saved humanity. Follow the thread. Abraham. God chose Abraham out of all the people on the earth. And what did Abraham say? What did God say to Abraham? I will make you a father of many nations. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. And in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. You see it? He's taking one man to save the world. Follow the thread to King David. You see, the thing is, is as the story of redemption moves forward, it gets clearer what God is doing. David, a righteous king, who ruled over the people in the land of promise. But David, just like God made a covenant with Noah and with Adam, God made uh, and with with, uh, Abraham, God made a covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In verse 12 it says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body. And I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Who is God talking about? Is he talking about Solomon? Kind of, but not really. You see it? Solomon built a temple for God, yes. But Jesus came and he says, I am the cornerstone of the house of God, the temple of God, which is the people of God. Who is the promised son of David who is also the son of God who sits on the throne forever? It's Christ. Paul sees the thread that goes through the Bible. And when he reads the promise to Abraham, he sees the promise being made not to, not to all of Abraham's descendants in specifically, but one of Abraham's uh, descendants in, in specific. A man named Jesus Christ. And so what is Paul saying? Paul's saying that the promise that God gave to Abraham was made to Jesus. How do you get then the inheritance that God promised to Jesus? You believe in him. God gave the promise to Christ. When you believe in Christ, the Bible says you are in Christ, and everything that God gives to Christ becomes yours. You see it? When you are in him, everything that he owns is yours. That's why the Bible says that we are heirs of the promise. We think about it. Based on the dating, roughly, 
God gave the promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago. That's a long time. The Bible says that that promise that God made to Abraham, God was planning all along, that promise was actually going to be made to you if you believe in Christ. Because in Christ, you receive the blessing of the promise. That's astounding. That's astounding. And so we receive the inheritance, the blessing, the land, a world free from sin in a place where we are in God's presence forever through Christ. So the promise, first of all, is given to Christ. Secondly, the law guarded us till Christ. The law guarded us till Christ. Verse 19 Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin... So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So, if the law cannot save and the law does not give you access to God's people, then why was the law given? Paul says it was added because of transgressions. What does that mean? The best way to understand it is that God gave us the law to point us to our need for him. The law shows us how righteous God is, and it shows us how unrighteous we are. And not only that, but the law actually, and this is what the Bible teaches, the law actually increases sin. It actually aggravates the problem of sin. In Romans 5 verse 20 it says, Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign in righteousness. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, it says, What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I, have not, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. What's he saying? He's saying the law shows the sinfulness of sin and the law actually aggravates sin because when someone gives you a law, it makes you want to break it. Anyone who has ever dealt with children knows what I'm talking about. If you want to get the kid to do something, almost a guaranteed way to do it is tell them not to do it. And they will do it. Why? Because of sin. Hear me now. Sin. It shows us how sinful we are. That it's preci- Sin is so great that precisely when God tells us what we're supposed to do, sin makes us not want to do it. That's how serious sin is. So the law actually increases the trespass. It shows us how desperately unrighteous we are and how desperately we need a Savior. So Paul says that the law then was a guardian the word there basically, it basically means a nanny. It means, his point there is that before Christ came and the, the full, full and final revelation of God was revealed of what God was doing throughout redemptive history, the law was given to us to pave the way. It was given to prepare the way. It was given to show It was given to highlight the black backdrop of sin against which the grace of God in Christ would shine all the brighter. 
And the, 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 the point of Paul saying that it was a guardian was that a child, when, uh, when but they, they're cared for, they're, they're watched over by a nanny, by a guardian, until they're old enough to exercise the responsibilities and privileges of adulthood for themselves. The, the emphasis there is on, the, it's on the, the, the fact that the law was temporary. The law was given for a season to prepare us, to hold us, to show us God's righteousness, to, to point us to Christ. But now that Christ has come, the law has served its purpose and is no longer necessary. Now... We can, we can enter directly by faith into full adulthood of what it means to be a child of God. Not under law, but under grace, changed by the power and the Spirit of God. So how can we, how can we apply what we're talking about? First, the, the big thing that I think is important for us to understand is that we must understand the inadequacy of the law. The law cannot change people. It cannot save people. The best the law can do is manage people's external behavior. But notice when Jesus Christ came, he changed the focus of the Jews from external behavior to internal righteousness. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And so, what's the point? The point is, is it's tempting to people... It's tempting to us to present Christianity as behavior modification. And that is not Christianity. An example, a very uh, example is parenting. It's very tempting as a parent, and I feel it. We all, if you've been a parent, you feel it. You will feel it. It's very tempting to make your kids, to just want to make your kids behave. To fit into the mold of expectation so that you can have nice little kids. And really it can be prideful because then people will just think you're a good parent. It's true. But guess what? What do you do if you teach your kids to be nice little kids and be nice to people, but you never actually teach them to say, you must love people from your heart? What do you create when you teach kids to, to be nice to people externally, but you never deal with the heart, you create three-foot-tall and four-foot-tall hypocrites and Pharisees. You do. If you never address the heart. That's why we must be careful to not just, not just make our kids behave, but you must address their heart. Tell them that they're sinners. And that it's the sin in their heart that causes them to disobey. Look, and this is not just true of kids. It's true of everybody. When, you, when someone is sinning, we tend to focus on the sin. But look, the sin is the symptom. It's not the disease. When people are sinning, it's because it's co- what is coming out is what's inside them. You can put a, you can put a serial killer in a straitjacket. You haven't saved them. You've just changed, you've just modified their behavior. And if we address behavior without addressing people's hearts, you're putting a band-aid on cancer. And so we have, we have to learn to when we talk to people and when we talk to our kids, you want to dig deeper than just saying, look, you need to get your act together. How do you... A person acts out what they believe. You want to change somebody? Don't tell them to change their behavior. You give them new beliefs. You tell them who Christ is and what he has done for them. And if this is true, then it changes everything about the way you think about the world. And if they believe in Christ, their life will change. The law, if you just give people law, one of two things will happen. Either they'll actually somehow... uh, keep the law externally and they'll get proud or they'll fail the law over and over and get and become despairing and depressed but if you give them the gospel they get grace and grace changes you listen to this poem from John Bunyan John Bunyan was a English Baptist 
And he famously, in his conversion story, he thought he became a Christian and then later realized that he actually wasn't. He was a legalist. He, he thought he was being saved by his newfound righteousness. And then he believed, and then after, only after that, when he understood God's grace, does he believe he was really converted. And John Bunyan wrote this poem. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. That's what the gospel does. By the Spirit inside of you, he comes, God comes in you and changes you so that you in, can o- indeed obey God, not because of external commands, but by internal commands. Righteousness. The promise is given to Christ. The law guarded us till Christ. Finally, we are heirs through Christ. We are heirs through Christ. Verse 26. For in Christ Jesus you were all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one. In Christ Jesus. And, you, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Because Christ has come and fulfilled the promises, fulfilled the law, we now have access to God and adoption into the family of God directly and decisively by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says as many as were baptized have put on Christ and What he means there is that baptism just represents the whole complex of salvation, the whole complex of conversion. In other words, he's just saying that if you were baptized, then that means that you were converted, you were saved. It should mean that. He's he's, he's assuming the two are equal. He's not saying it's some kind of magical getting wet, has, has a magical power. The point, what Paul is saying, though, is this. If you have... If you have been converted, if you, if you have trusted in Christ, been born again, have been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, what Paul is saying is you have put on Christ. That means you have a new identity. God has changed who you are and has given you a new identity. You do not stand before God just as yourself in your sin. Rather, you stand before God as one who has put on Christ. What does that mean? It means that, it means that if God looks at you, he does not look at you apart from seeing Christ. You see that? He, he does not look, when God looks at you, since you have put on Christ, he has to look through Christ to look to you. Every, every time God looks of you, he sees it through the lens of, Of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore everything that Jesus deserves you get. That's what it means to be a Christian. We together, everyone, we're all the same. Jew, non-Jew, male, female, slave, free. Who, No matter who you are or where you're from. We are recipients of the promises of God together. Through faith in Christ. And the last thing I want to say is this. What Paul is teaching here is the only hope in this world for true unity. We live in 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 a really divided world. And the reason why it's so divided is because we all have conflicting identities. When I identify with something, if I say... You know, I'm white, I'm black, I'm Republican, I'm Democrat, I'm this, I'm that. You, you're, you're staking your identity on something, and that automatically puts you at odds with people of a different identity. What Paul is saying here is that when you are in Jesus Christ, you put on a new identity that automatically supersedes and trumps every other identity you have. So then... Because of Jesus Christ and who he is, there can be someone who may be totally different from me in every way. But if Jesus Christ is the sun in the center of their solar system, we're brothers. Doesn't matter how else different we are in every other possible way. If Jesus Christ is our ultimate 
And if it trumps everything else, and my loyalty is to Jesus Christ above any other thing about my life, we can be unified. To some people, that sounds too simplistic, but I think they don't understand the depth of what I'm talking about. When your identity is so deeply rooted in Christ that, look, Christ will challenge your other identities. There are things that we accept and believe because of different things, that different experiences in our lives. Christ will challenge some of those. But if Christ is your ultimate identity, then that will trump those things. And when Christ is our ultimate, then we are united in him. So, the promise is given to Christ. The law guarded us till Christ. We are heirs through Christ. Jesus Christ came and died so that all people, regardless of race, culture, social, economic standing, religious or irreligious, no matter what you've been doing or for how long you've been doing it, if you turn away from your sin to Christ and find in him a new identity that trumps all identities, you become a child of God, an inheritor of the promise. And we will inherit it together in a world free from sin.